Do you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. Okay, so hi, yeah, I'm John. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Thanks, Alej, for inviting. Um, okay, so uh, how many here are, are somehow related to university? Just for me to get a, a fast stat. Okay, so, okay, and the other, I assume that you are in industry or just here because you like machine learning? Okay, good. How many of you are, I guess that most of you have heard about deep learning? Uh, maybe not in the right places. Maybe you heard about deep learning in the news, in the, you know, in, on television. So that's why I'm here trying to set things a bit straight for you. Uh, and so not everything is good, so, but there are things that are good. So what I will try to do in that, in that time that, that I have is try to tell you a little bit what I think is good from the field, uh, what thing, which things are not so good, and which things maybe can be improved. And if we have time, I will uh, end up with a little bit more researchy slides telling you about what, of the, what are the new things that I'm working on with some of my students. And OK, so I would like to make this super informal. So you will be asking me questions, and I will be asking you questions. So don't be afraid. I mean, those of you who are in the first line are probably going to get more questions than the other ones. So if you want to move, you can do it now. But hopefully, you will stay. OK, so uh, for those of you here that never heard about uh, deep learning or never heard about ConfNets, I'll have a, some slides for you. Uh, so just stop me whenever you have a question, something that is not clear. OK, okay so what is good about deep learning? Uh, what I think is good in deep learning is that there's one sub area of deep learning, that is the convolutional neural networks, that these are things that really work. OK, so it's really, I mean, other, anything that is not a ConfNet, and they try to sell you as something like an algorithm that is deep learning and it works, it's going to work uh, wonderful in my data set. Ask if it's a convolutional neural network. Okay, if it's not, uh, well, we all think that RNNs are also very cool. I kind of agree, but components are cooler. Okay, and I'll try to, start to explain you a little bit why I believe that that's the case. Okay, so what is a component? So actually, a component starts with all of us, starts with the brain. Okay, so. Uh, Visual cortex is the, some stuff here that we have on the back of our skull. Uh, we use it for uh, knowing where we are and recognizing stuff. And so uh, there were very interesting, intelligent people, uh, Huber and Weasel, who were trying to wonder what was the sort of the model for that sort of that part of the cortex. <laughs> okay. And because of this work, they incidentally got the Nobel Prize by finding the right model. And so what was this model? Is this idea that we have uh, some some stuff in the retina, okay, little cells in the retina that capture f photons that come from the world. And these photons are aggregated into small uh, receptive fields that they call that uh, send this information to another layer of neurons. And these neurons receive the information that is sent by the first layer of neurons, do some complicated stuff, and then they are, there's another layer of neurons that takes the responses of these neurons and does something something a bit similar, and so on, and so on, and so on. So this is a model that is uh, pretty, uh, makes sense, right? Uh, um, why not? Uh, but but the, the really interesting thing is that it's, it was really inspired by biology. Okay, so ConfNet and deep learning is really something that starts with ex people really opening skulls of whatever animals, I don't remember which animals were, they were, but you know, ex uh, doing, coming up with theories, and trying to validate these theories. And so, so far, no computer science, right? This is just uh, doctors in a lab. Okay, so when does computer science enter into the game? It enters the game with this crazy Japanese guy, Fukushima, who was really a pioneer. Okay, so he realized that, well, if a brain can do this with that architecture, perhaps I could try to use the same architecture to, you know, to uh, implement it in a computer and use it to solve artificial vision tasks. And so that was his idea, and it was actually a pretty, like a pretty, uh, a paper that was ahead of his time somehow. And so that was the architecture, except that there was a problem that he didn't know how to train. Okay, so in this architecture, what do we have? We have again input, so these are pixels. And then we have some rules to two operations on these pixels that are repeated um, after, uh, they're repeated a number of layers that is specified here by this diagram. But of course, these operations require some parameters. Okay, so how do you take these pixels and produce these ones? So you need to construct some form of weighted average. 
So how do you choose these weights? So that's what machine learning is about, right? Uh, looking at the data and maybe coming up with what is the best set of parameters that solve this task. So he didn't really know how to do that. So he just had some heuristics and it didn't really work so well. So this thing was not really uh, the answer. And so then we had Jan Lekan who still believed that this was a good model, it was a cool model. And then he just combined uh, this model with the right algorithm. Okay, so he just uh, decided to try to uh, train this algorithm uh, using, I think I'm gonna switch to this one because it's better. Okay, is it better? Is it good now? Yeah, okay. Okay, so then Jan uh, took this architecture and he combined it with a very naive algorithm. Some of you here have done probably math uh, in high school, I guess, all of you. Okay, so he basically combined the chain rule with this model, okay? And so once you have some objective, so you have an input, uh, it computes some output, and then you have to tell the computer, well, I would like this output to be moved closer to some target, okay? So for example, if my computer decides that, I don't know, I'm, uh, you know, I don't know, I'm not blonde, okay? I will tell the computer that I should modify my output to, to move me to into something that is, I don't know, brown color or something. And so then you just have to uh, inf propagate the information back into the lower layers. And that's mm. something that he managed to do with these very small uh, layers, this very, very small network. Okay, and so that really um, created something that was very popular, hugely popular, and not only popular in the machine learning community in the academic world, but also really uh, deployed in the industry. Okay, and it was something that I mentioned yesterday that I really found, find something that sometimes is a bit understated, okay? I told you that you have this model that comes from a neuroscientist, and I told you that you have this chain rule that comes from the 18th century, and then you put them together. Someone could say, well, what's, what's the point, right? It's super easy, I mean, that was, that's really not, not new. But look, you have something that reads, I don't know how many million checks a day using this, right? And so if it was so easy, why it hasn't, it hasn't been done before? And so this is something that, let's keep this in mind, and it's one of the strong points in deep, I mean, of deep learning, that don't really understate them because it's, they are doing simple things, right? This thing that works is very important. And so, okay, so that's where we are. We have these models that are good to recognize automatically these digits that are written in checks or in papers or whatever. And so uh, these things actually were, uh, as a matter of fact, they were working very well, not only to read checks and to read numbers, but to solve many, th many, tasks, many tasks across computer vision. Uh, face recognition is one example. Uh, and somehow, uh, despite being so good, uh, if you go to a conference, if you had gone to a conference in, I don't know, 2010, 2009 in computer vision, like CVPR or even NIPS or these things, they were really laughing at these things. Okay, so they, were, they had Jan in the corner of the room and he would, he would give his talk uh, people would, you know, uh, like applaud very, you know, politely, but then, okay, next one. Okay, and that was it. That was the state of deep learning uh, until 2012. Despite working very well, I mean, that's, here you have an algorithm that uh, manages to recognize faces in a picture. Okay, that's pretty cool. Uh, other things that these things were, uh, were applied and they were actually very good at doing. They were very good at, for example, doing automatic uh, scene leveling. Okay, so here you have a camera that you can use, I don't know, in a GoPro, let's say, or something that you are w walking along the street, and you would like maybe to label every pixel that you see as belonging to, that's the road, that's, that's the road, that's the building, that's the, that's the sky, all these things, right? So it's not just, oh, you know. Okay, is it good now? Okay, yeah, that's much, that's much uh, more similar to what I do usually. Okay, so, so that's a problem where every pixel has to be uh, labeled. Okay, so imagine that this is much, a priori much harder than having to just come up with a label for the whole image. How do you do that? You do it with a ConfNet. Okay, a very, uh, like a particular ConfNet, but just keep this in mind. Okay, so that is a model that you can use for that task as well. Uh, by the way, this is a task that I think that is, if for us, for humans, it's pretty hard actually. No, you have to really spend a long time doing this. Okay, I give you a picture. Yeah, maybe you can do it, but it, you ta it, takes, it doesn't take you 
Uh, it doesn't take you a couple of, you know, uh, 20 milliseconds to do that. It's really something that is quite laborious, and these models are pretty good at doing it. Uh, okay, so that's sort of, sort of a slide that I have here for the skepticals. I don't know how many skepticals are here, like people who are really purist in math, but that's basically the slide for you. So deep learning is just a bunch, a bunch of algorithms that are pretty naive, that are trained. I, I here I have the formula. In a sense, it's one slide that resumes all there is to know if you want to just go there and implement your deep learning model. Okay, so you just need to know that you have to repeat an operation that is essentially a linear operation. You combine it with your favorite pointwise nonlinearity. I mean, you can choose the thresholding, you can choose anything else. You can repeat a bunch of them uh, and you come up with a loss that is essentially uh, here a model that, that we use to model output probabilities, okay, discrete spaces. And then you train it with a stochastic gradient descent. That's it. Okay, so that's, in a sense, that's why it was too simple. That's why people didn't like it. Okay, it was too simple. So there are many other reasons why people didn't like it. Uh, of course, these things, in order to start working well, you need a relatively large uh, training set. Okay, so, and that was, I agree, that's a problem. Uh, and that's a, that's a valid point. But it doesn't mean that it's not that it's useless, right? There are many other examples where we have a bunch of data points. So uh, there was a lot of people who were sort of defending their territory. Okay, so you spend I don't know uh, one year and two grad students uh, working on you know coming up with good features for your problem, and now someone else comes and tells you, well, I can do the same automatically. It's not so easy. Right, you have to, you know, there's some ego involved, there's some politics involved, that's not very good sometimes. And that's another reason for more like mathematicians, right? It's ugly when you have to solve this problem. We don't have, we don't have any theorem, we cannot prove anything about this problem, about the optimization of this problem. Okay, so some people, you tell them that they cannot prove anything, they run, okay, so they, they don't like it. Uh, many other reasons, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here. But then what happened? Then uh, what happened, it was 2012, uh, there was uh, a bunch of, a, a team of crazy people in Toronto, Toronto, very cold city. Sometimes it might, it might correlate, right? If you are in a place that is super cold and you have a lot of time to do, you know, to work in your room, maybe you can uh, create a breakthrough. I don't know. So what happened is that they, they sort of took this model and they continue to believe, right? And it's pretty crazy. I mean, I've talked, I've talked, I've known these guys and when we, think, when we talk about it with our colleagues, it's so crazy. I mean, you have an algorithm that the field is super skeptical about. Okay, so any, no PhD advisor would tell you, go and work in this model. There was a couple of PhD advisors that were crazy, like Hinton and maybe Jan. Okay, so there were only two creative advisors that were believing in this model. And you have two PhD students in those groups, in that group in Toronto, that spent month and month and month and month trying it. But look, think about this. As, until the last day, until it doesn't work, until it works, it doesn't work, okay? So you try this, it's crap, and then why would you continue? Why wouldn't you jump into a, something that is safer? So you really need to be a bit crazy, right? So they continued, they tuned the hell out of it, they used a uh, very, it's not, it was not just tuning, they really had to solve a huge architectural problem, okay? So they had just, it was a time where GPUs were still, they were not a commodity as today, they had to really be very creative in making these GPUs work. But they managed to do it and they completely crushed this problem. Okay, so for those of you who don't know what this is, this is a sort of a competition. It's like the Olympics of computer vision, right? So you have a competition where everyone competes with an algorithm and you are ranked automatically by like a jury, if you want, but there's no subject, it's completely objective, right? So you send your algorithm, it's tested on a data set, and then you are ranked by how good you do. Okay, so they did really much better than the rest, and using a CompNet. And then, of course, everyone realized that that was the way to go, right? From two PhD advisors, you jumped into 20 this year, and here maybe you had 200 or 2,000, whatever. Okay, so now it's all red. The field is completely changed, okay? And this is the most challenging task in computer vision, okay? It's not the only one, but that was the, really the one that was uh, deciding everything. Okay, any questions so far? So you know all this, all this stuff, right? What? Red is CompNet. Okay, so that is, red is using the method that no one liked before. Okay, and so 
uh, another picture doing the same thing. Uh, humans are somehow at 4% in this task, okay? So we are superhuman in that task. It doesn't, sorry, don't, no, I take it back. In that task, okay, so if I have a collection, this particular family of images, these algorithms learn how to be better, okay? It doesn't mean that now I give the same algorithm uh, image label that it has never seen before, it's gonna be much worse than us, okay? But in the, in the things it has been trained on, it does better than us, okay? And so that was really, really not the case five years ago. Same thing for other tasks, okay? So not just classification, but also localization. What is localization is finding where the object is in the scene, okay? Not just telling it what it is, but also where is it. Also completely crazy, okay? The jump that we have here is really, really important. Okay, so just for, just for some perspective, okay? Having a jump that is going from 20% to 5%, it's something that can take, I don't know, 40 years, right? In a normal uh, field, in a normal circumstance. Here it's one year. Okay, uh, not only classification, so that's uh, again something that is just the background and context. Uh, you can use the same thing for speech, not just for to recognize images, but also to recognize speech. Okay, and so speech recognition, you have to see that it's a field that has, it's pretty old, right? It has like almost 30 years old now. Okay, so, and people have been working on this a lot, a lot, a lot. You can imagine the business impact or like the, you know, like the economical interest on having the ability to understand what we say automatically, right? You can imagine the, the scale of this problem. So you had all these uh, com uh, monopolies like AT&T, Bell Labs, they were heavily investing on this problem. IBM has historically been has like the strongest groups in speech recognition, but somehow they reached a plateau. Okay, so they were improving, improving, improving. They reached a plateau. Okay, things were not improving. Why? We don't know. But then they started to use these models, okay, these convolutional neural networks applied for speech recognition, and boom, we get the same sort of dramatic improvement. You can use this to recognize faces. And not only, so I told you here before in the ImageNet problem here, you have uh, a thousand categories. Okay, so you have a thousand different objects that are sort of chosen somehow randomly. Uh, you have dogs, you have flowers, you have all this stuff. Here you have a problem, rec face recognition. That, that's something that is deployed at Facebook. How many labels do you have? Billions. Billions. Billions, of the order of a billion. Okay, so you have to, so this algorithm is able to recognize a face among a million, a billion. Okay, so it's an American billion, it's not a Spanish billion. Okay, and so what, how does it do it? Same story, but of course, there's a lot of engineering work to make this work. Okay? There's a lot of work behind to make this happen. But it's basically, it's basically the same model. I don't know if you're happy with knowing that Facebook, Facebook can recognize faces. <laughs> I think I don't care. I mean, uh, people are a bit afraid of privacy. But, I mean, I don't know. That's more a philosophical question. I think it can be, it's not a big problem. I mean, and Zuckerberg is a nice guy, so it's, he's not going to do anything wrong to you. Okay, what else? Uh, not only for images and speech, you can also apply it for any sort of any data, any data that has some sort of spatial structure. Okay, so not just uh, images have pixels, pixels are organized in a, spa in, in a grid, very nice. Uh, speech is organized as a time series, you have like information that comes at every time step. But you have other, many other examples where you have uh, structure that can be absorbed and can be eaten by a component. And this is one example, uh, you have many others. Okay, so that's other uh, object localization, I think I told you about it. So just deciding where things are. Uh, pose estimation, that's done by a friend of mine, so that's why I put it here. Very cool paper, if you don't know it. Uh, also very, yeah, very funny. Uh, segmentation, so think about this, it's completely crazy, right? This is done automatically. Okay, you, you input the image and the algorithm understands that this is a, this is a single object, right? This is a single object. I find it completely crazy. I find it very, very impressive, okay? And it's doing it, something that was, if you show this like five years ago, they would say, no, oh, you're cheating, okay? So it's really something that, that changed and happened in very, very fast, okay? And using, when I look at, when you look at, when I show you the algorithm that does it, there's only components around. Yes? Yes, well, no freelance, right? 
I mean, that would be then it would be crazy. I mean, that would be even more crazy, right? If the thing learned by itself. No, no. So you need labels. Yeah, yeah. OK, other things, something that Uriol and others worked on, uh, captioning. I probably heard this on the BBC, on the news, right? You have input an image, and the algorithm is going to tell what's going on. You know, these things are really important, right? I mean, they, they can be very, very cool for many people. And of course, they, Google, uh, Facebook, Twitter, all these companies, of course, they are using these things to make our interaction with these systems much easier. OK, Uriol was telling yesterday that he's actually relying on this technology to find his car, I think. That's what he said, right? Or to find whatever he has there. And of course, uh, you can use this in uh, neuroscience. And I was, talking with, I was talking with people who are in neuroscience, and they are telling me that now, if you go back to the first slide, I told you that you had these two guys that were coming up with this. Maybe this, this is a good model to understand vision. Well, now we have something that we can really use as a, as a, as a tool to, to test our theories, right? I mean, if this is a good model, Maybe we can understand how the, you know, some particular neurons are going to react. And then we have something, a hypothesis that we can verify. Okay, so we can, let's say, well, if we take this image and we produce an image that has this representation, that would happen, that should happen. And now we can go to a subject and try it and verify this, this theory. Okay, so it's, neuroscientists are really, really excited about these things. Okay, so they are really, really, it's really important for them. I had a, like a little video here, I don't know if that's going to work, but let's try. No? Okay, I don't know if you saw it, but that's another example of, uh, I don't know, so did you see it before? Okay, so that's another uh, idea where you can see this technology in action. Okay, so of course it's not me who did this, it's uh, actually a colleague from Berkeley, uh, Sergey Levine, uh, and he used the, the money from Google to build uh, this arm farm that they call it, so it's like a factory of arms, robots, and they are all trying to learn how to grasp things. Okay, so you have a bunch of like a tray of objects and the goal of the game is to grasp. Super easy. I don't know at what age uh, babies do that. I don't know, maybe six months, a bit later. Okay, so it takes six months of a human to learn how to grasp. I don't know how many, oh, it stopped. Well, you saw it already. Okay, so it, it, it took, I don't know how long it took to train this thing. But it was pretty impressive. Okay, so they had the, this result like a couple of months ago, uh, like some months ago, and the key to, for this thing to work was again the same tool, the same the same element here. Okay, so you know these algorithms can really make a uh, lot of things uh, work very good. And that's of course there's no there's no question. This is a good part of deep learning, right? This thing did not happen before. Okay, and and who knows what if we if we would one day we'll be able to do this with an alternative technology. But here we are. Okay, we have these things that are really helping uh, things a lot. So other things that I like about uh, deep learning, I, I like the fact that it's a very democratic uh, thing. And let me try to explain what I mean by that. Uh, probably some of you, or all of you are, you know, uh, tinkering with these models. Okay, so these things are all, so, okay, how do you go from these mathematical formulas to something that actually works? Like, you have to program these things, you have to implement these things. And it turns out that we have very good tools for that. Okay, so I don't know, probably here most of you are now very fan of TensorFlow. Uh, there's a book, no, I think, that was presented here in this meetup, I guess. TensorFlow is good, but you have alternatives, like uh, this thing comes from, from Berkeley. So that's why I try to do some advertisement here. This thing comes from Facebook, that's why I do some advertisement of Torch. And this thing comes from Montreal. So these are all different uh, sort of environments, uh, software that are mostly built on top of uh, like C++, uh, Lua, and Python, Python. And these things are now super popular, okay? So it's starting to, to get a lot of uh, visibility, a lot of exposure, not just within the machine learning community, but in the sort of software community, okay? So everyone can do it, okay? So you can now go to TensorFlow and have your mo neural network up and running in like 20 minutes, okay? Um, good, even me, I can do it. I mean, it's and I'm not very good at uh, coding. Okay, what else? You have, the, you have the tools, you have the software, but how do you go and implement stuff? I mean, how do you learn this stuff? And deep learning now is actually starting to be very, very, very available. I mean, we can, you have a lot of resources available. Uh, you have uh, learning in YouTube, probably you get a lot of lectures, in particular the ones from our machine learning summer school, these are the best ones. Uh, 
You have a very nice uh, online class by Google Brain, and this is Vincent, who is in, from Google Brain, very nice guy. Uh, you should try to, to follow his class. And you have a, a not just lectures, not just videos, but also, uh, you know, if you want to learn a bit more, if you want to go a bit more in depth, I really recommend uh, Andre Karpatis' uh, class. Uh, I don't know if here people have followed his class, no? Well, so that's a very nice class. And then there's also my stuff, if you want to get a bit more mathy. There's, there's some uh, material online that you can check on my website if you're interested. And then uh, you not only have uh, sort of lectures, but you also have the research is really on the open. Okay, so we are in a community that we really like archive. Okay, we are, and I will come back to this a bit uh, later. We, maybe we like it a bit too much, okay? But we really like archive. And so you can really get up to date very fast, okay, in that field. No, not only that, we, so we have software, we have algorithms, we have, we have whatever theory is available. We also have free data, okay, which is something that, for example, if you are working on biology or, you know, on medicine, well, you might, you know, you might have to be, you better be in a very rich and strong lab if you want to do experiments, right? I mean, data is expensive. Here, it's completely the opposite. We have the famous ImageNet. You can play with it for free. You don't have to pay anything. You can now use the very, very, very cool, if you like it, if you are into reinforcement learning, you can, I really invite you to go to check the gym, OpenAI. So that's a platform that is really trying to, demo, to create something really democratic if you wanna compete in reinforcement learning. Uh, you can use the Coco dataset for uh, localization and captioning. And you can use, uh, that's another thing that I really like a lot, it's called the Babel tasks from Facebook. So for example, uh, you could try to see if you are good at, at following this dialogue, right? If you have your algorithm, uh, understand how to answer these questions. Okay, so for example, Mary moved to the bathroom, John went to the hallway, where is Mary? Well, for us it's completely trivial, but go and try to implement an algorithm that is able to answer this question. Well, now you can try, you can compare yourself with uh, competing algorithms. Okay, and we have now people who really worked a lot <coughs> to make this thing very easy, very painless to compare. Okay, so I told you about uh, cool things, okay? Uh, applications, I told you about, uh, it's easy to use for everyone. But me, I think I'm more, you know, I also like math a little bit. I like to understand things, okay? I like to go a little bit into the theory. And it's really, really, really the best time for me to be in that field, okay? And there's, the reason is because we don't understand almost anything, okay? We know very little about these things. I told you that these things are very wonderful, but the fact is that we don't really understand why. Okay, so why, these things, why do these things work so well? We might have some ideas. I, you, yesterday in my talk, you might, uh, you know, you, might get, you might have got some ideas on why this thing can start to be the reason why these things work, but we are still very far, okay? There are many, many things that we don't know. Uh, the optimization aspect of these networks is really at the center of the stage, okay? Uh, everyone uses an algorithm that was invented in the 50s, okay? Stochastic gradient descent is an algorithm that comes from the 50s. And it's an algorithm that works everything, okay? It's like, if it's, it's a, it's as if you had a, a tool, like a screwdriver, that was one size fits all, okay? So you have a, tool, a screwdriver that works for any problem. And that's the one we are using, okay? We don't have any other tool that is better right now. But, and we are still working in a class of problems that is very, 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 very concrete, right? Very small. Can we do better? We don't know, okay? We don't have a better tool right now. Something that uh, might be relevant for the folks at the uh, Barcelona Supercomputing Center. How can you distribute these algorithms, okay? So that's another very complicated open question in theory. Uh, something that is uh, relevant for people more into the neuroscience world, okay? So they have this algorithm that produces awesome outputs, but well, I mean, if you want to do science and you want to relate this to some real stuff, you need to interpret, you need to give a meaning to these uh, neurons, to these features. Very little is known on this. Uh, and then the other thing that is very important, I will put it later in the box of things that I don't like, is that we need error bars, okay? We are here doing essentially stats, okay? We are having data, the data is a sample of the world, and we are doing predictions in outside what the algorithm has been tested on. So we, there's always an error, okay? 
and we need to have this error. So for those of you who are here, maybe going to apply this stuff and you know, maybe someday, I don't know if you want to publish these things, please try to do error bars, okay? I have this rule that I systematically tend to reject papers that don't even mention error bars, okay? So I hope, I hope you will come with a reviewer that is nicer than me. Okay, so here's a list of, uh, for the, it's like for those of you who know a little bit what, whatever this means, right? So this is a, a bunch of things that I consider to be part of the picture, okay? So, and actually that's a, that's a question that that's, it's actually it's an interesting slide because this, what, what I try to say here is that it's a very hard problem, okay? It's not, uh, you, take a last, you take a class of, you know, TensorFlow for a couple of hours and then you take a class of uh, Andrew Eng's uh, machine learning and then you read a couple of papers and then you are good to go. You can crack the problem. No, but you really need to be pretty good at all these things, okay? You need to be pretty good. You have to, you know, it's, it's, it's really deep. It's really important stuff. And so, uh, of course, this can be completely wrong and, you know, tomorrow uh, someone comes and solves the problem and this thing, you can throw it, but uh, that's, that's what I feel, what I think today. Any questions? Okay, someone, a question that I was expecting to, to get asked today, but okay, it's here for you. So I guess that you know this uh, fable from La Fontaine, uh, you know, the tortoise and the hare, like, uh, what, what is hare in Spanish? Uh, yebra, 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 yebra y tortuga. So that's the fable, of course, you know, I guess that you have heard the story. Uh, you have, you know, some, someone who is really going a priori faster than the other, but <coughs> at the end it's not so clear. So that's something that you could use to compare theory and practice, right? And typically you have these practitioners and then you have the theoreticians and they work at different speeds, right? They, they are there together in the field, they help each other. But some people might, you know, might think that, well, people who are just the implementing engineers, they go much faster, right? Why do we care about theory? Uh, you know, uh, theory is a tortoise. Uh, whatever this tortoise is gonna do, it's not, I don't care at all. Uh, and actually, machine learning uh, is really an experimental uh, science, right? It's really, I mean, we need experiment. I mean, we can do all the statistical learning theory we want. If the stuff doesn't work, we don't care, okay? Uh, and it's normal in a sense that the hair is faster at some point, goes faster, in the sense that the experiment is normal that they go uh, ahead of the theory, okay? I, I only know one example, one case where that was not the, what, that was reversed, okay? And the, Maybe you guys, you guys can tell me another example, but for me, the only thing I could think of is the, is the Einstein, right? The, it's, he's the only guy who said, well, yeah, there will be this gravitational wave because look at my theorem, it should be here. And then boom, 100 years later. So what about SVMs? Yeah. SVMs, good question. Where do you put SVMs? Where would you put them? Well, so there the theory came before the question. So it's the same thing in Boston, so I think it's been possible. Mm, yeah, right. it came at Bell Labs, right? And people were, Tinkerers there. Well, yeah, I know. Yeah, that's true. That's true. SVM. I, yeah, SVM. Good. But SVM, yeah, okay. So there was a point where maybe SVM was ahead, and that was really pretty impressive. But, well, Einstein is very impressive as well, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so another question is why do we need a theory? Why do we care, right? other than that is paying jobs for professors and you know, maybe uh, teaching your kids? Well, I think that theory is important, right? First, it really creates a legacy, okay? Uh, I mean, passing knowledge to the, to the, you know, to the people 100 years from now is not just this graph I told you before of ImageNet, right? 4% in ImageNet with a complicated algorithm with two billion parameters, right? We really want, yes? Why do they need, they need to learn if, uh, What? Why they need to learn if neural network, network will do everything? Sorry, I, I, yeah, sorry, I don't understand the question. <laughs> it's just a joke. It's ah. <laughs> <laughs> Why we need to expl explain them uh, these things if neural network will do everything? Oh, no, they, they won't do everything. Did, 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 I, did I sort of... In, uh, well, it seems like... Did they suggest that they were going to do everything? No, I mean, they were very good at solving some vision tasks. And I will, you will see later that there are many things that they don't know how to do, right? And, and the fact is that there are many things that we don't, I mean, 
Yeah, I, I don't know if he was the, the guy who said it, but you know, you had this uh, Republican guy uh, from uh, the Bush government. Maybe you know Angel. Uh, like he was saying, there's the thing that we know, there's the thing that we know that we don't know. Right? Uh, yes. Yes. So there are many things that we don't know that we don't know, right? Uh, Rumsfeld? No? Donald Rumsfeld? Yeah. yeah. So there are many things that we, I mean, it's not even that we can say that we don't know them. I mean, it's like we are at a stage that it, we are completely lost. Okay, so what I said is that, yeah, so there are many things that we want to understand before passing, passing them to the next generation, right? I mean, I, in a sense, it gives us closure, right? I mean, you really want to, until you, I mean, there's a class of people who, until they don't really understand what's going on, they are not happy, okay? And that's theory, and that's why theory can help. And the other thing that I, it's, I really believe is that despite what you might think, actually, I think that understanding a theory is, is easier than understanding a collection of experiments, right? If I have a collection of experiments, how can you make sense of, you know, uh, there are many disciplines right now in deep learning that you start looking at the papers and, well, it's a mess, right? I mean, how can you even understand this, what is going on if every new experiment might give you a new data point that is completely, I mean, I think it's something pretty natural that uh, theory is like, you know, like something that's like a meta-learning, okay? You, uh, you try to put all the points in the experiments together into some sort of unified, stuff that, under, that connects everything. Okay, and that's for me the role of theory. And it's not a problem if it comes later. Okay, it's, it's not a problem for me. Other thing, another interesting thing, is that it's this of efficiency, right? How can you be sure that you're in the right track until you have a, a solid theory for it? Okay, and there's a very nice example that Jan, someone sometimes talks about, is this, I don't know if you know this Clemana there. Okay, so he was a, like a French inventor from the beginning of the century and he was obsessed with learning how to fly, and he came up with this model here. And you can feel that there's something that's pretty wrong, right? In this prototype. It looks like a bat. I mean, it, so in a sense it's trying, okay, a bat knows how to, learn, how to fly, therefore, if I imitate a bat, I will learn how to fly. So it didn't really understand the, the principle of flying, right? It didn't understand that if you just have this, uh, you know, this, like this force, that, like these wings that sort of, uh, I think it's called portants. I'm in I know in French, I don't know how to call it in, in Catalan. Okay, so you didn't really understand the principle that makes uh, planes fly. And the other thing that is actually uh, very important, I think, is negative results. Theory sometimes can be used to say, you cannot do better than this, okay? There's no point in continuing to investigate. The theory is nailing what we can and we cannot do. Okay, and here in deep learning, we really need negative results. Okay, and this is something that, you know, you can uh, apply to yourself in evolution, right? I mean, there are things that we understand what's going on, right? There's no point in continuing to investigate, I don't know, I'm not an expert in uh, genomics or whatever, but you can, you, you see what I mean, right? And there's an example that I really like, and this, I apologize for this little uh, detour. It's a, like a couple of slides that I have a little bit, has have two theorems, sorry about that. Okay, but it's something that I really like. Okay, uh, who knows about optimization he here? Who is using, only three people? No, more people, okay. So you know gradient descent, right? Gradient descent, good. So gradient descent is an algorithm to optimize a function, right? And we know how to say things when this function is convex. Convex is the function that has a, like, has a well. Okay, so I think that it's a convex function, so it has only one point where it's minimum. Okay, and this point is well identified, so you can understand how fast you reach that solution. What is important here is this little rate, okay, this one over t. Okay, it means that I can go fast, I can approach a solution at a rate that is one over t. And there are some assumptions. Question, can you do better? Can you do better only using basically gradients? And what I mean by using gradients is using the same complexity. Okay, you don't want to make the algorithm super expensive, Using the same complexity, can you go faster to the solution? What happens if Hessian? Oh no, forget about Hessian. Yeah, Hessian is too, too expensive to compute. It's, it's, it's expensive to compute? It's quadratic, yeah. And then you can approximate the Hessian to make it linear, but then you are in this territory. Okay, so everything that is, so that's the difference that I say with first and second order methods. Okay, first order methods are methods that only look at the gradient of the function. Okay, so I think that the, you have a query, and the query only gives you gradients. Okay, you are you are not allowed to compute Hessians. Why, so do, you, why do you know about this optimization? Why? Why Sorry. Why, why do you add this precision to, to 
Sorry? Why do apply you Hessian? Because uh, uh, you need to invert the Hessian, right? If you want to apply new method. So how, how many operations do you need to invert a Hessian that has a million by a million? Well, do you want to wait? I mean, we can make a, cho we can make a game, right? I, you run the Hessian, I run the SGT. And let's see who goes faster. Well, but this question is on a bounded amount of time, right? I only have a couple of hours. Do I want to use the Hessian or not? OK. So here, I, I'm not going to use the Hessian. OK? I'm going to use only gradients. Can I do better? Someone? You know. <laughs> what? What do you have to do? Yes, momentum. OK? Momentum is what we have when we move, right? We have some, you know, I mean, I'm running, so I have momentum. So in a sense, uh, the gradient tells me uh, you should turn, but uh, I'm moving, so I have to take a little bit longer to, to turn, right? That's momentum. So what do you do with momentum? So crazy, another crazy guy, Nesterov, he understood everything. He tells us, well, instead of doing gradient descent, why don't you do that? You don't really understand where these things come from. You do that, and boom, you replace the t by t squared. OK? And actually, it looks, it, it looks complicated. It is complicated. People who work on optimization still don't understand how come Nesterov had this idea. Okay? It's, it looks, it's really magic, and it works very well. Okay? Everyone uses momentum. Okay, now I, I ask the friend question. Can you do better? So how do you know that your function is convex? No, no, you don't know it. But, uh, but the momentum can take it very to the edge. No, but I mean, even if you are in a non-convex optimization function, the only thing you can hope for is to go as fast as you can to whatever local minimum you have closest to you. So if I give you the choice, you can go very slowly to a local minimum, or you can go very fast to a local minimum. What do you prefer? Too fast. But what about if you go, if you pass the local minimum, but you're going too fast? We don't know how to do that. What do you mean? We, we don't have any algorithm that can magically jump from a, a bad local minimum to a good local minimum. I mean, if you know how to do that, you will probably get very famous and very rich. Okay, it's very, it's a very hard, it's a, it's a very complicated thing to do. Okay, and I mean maybe you can do this in some context, and that's a very open, interesting question. Yeah, yeah. So you are following the gradient, okay, and the gradient is going to push you down. Okay, so if you, if, if to go uh, even deeper, you first have to go up and then go down. That's a pretty good, it's a pretty big risk. Okay, and you can actually, I mean, there's people who like to to you know to see this question as like as in, as in, as in human life okay and there was this very nice uh, metaphor by John Schulman uh, last week in the reinforcement learning is that you have to th you can do two things you can start taking crack smoking crack or you can go to school okay so what do you prefer i mean if you look at if you look at what is the immediate reward okay what what is going to make you happier uh, the next 10 minutes you want to smoke crack, right? Because that's, you know, that's the, uh, well, I, I'm using, I'm borrowing his example, OK? Uh, but you know, going to school is painful, right? It's painful. And then you only start to see the, the, the effects, the nice effects of going to school after many, many time, many years ahead, right? So it's a very hard thing to do. I mean, we know how to, humans sort of learn how to, you know, go to better local minimum than just uh, the one that comes by taking drugs. But algorithms don't know how to do that. Okay, so some algorithms know how to do it, but it's not in that not in that complexity. Okay, not in so, so many dimensions. Okay, I hope I under, I answered a little bit the question. Okay. Okay, so can we do better than than the sec, than this momentum with the first order method? No, we cannot. Okay, and there's another theorem that tells you that uh, essentially uh, there's always there will be always functions out there where the rate of any algorithm is going to be t squared. Okay? So essentially, he completely solved the problem. Okay? Using momentum, there's no, way, there's no hope that you can do better. Okay? And actually, that's, an, that's, the quen that's the question here that I put. You know, I would be super happy if someone answers. Otherwise, don't worry. Someone knows how someone has an intuition of what is the underlying reason. It's a Russian guy, another Russian guy, of course. Okay, it's Chebyshev polynomials. Okay, so that's 
something super beautiful, right? I mean, we studied Chebyshev polynomials, maybe in a random lesson in, no, not in high school, in the university, probably. And now they tell us that, you know, if you have a, like an engineer working in a deep learning company and he says, oh, I have this cool idea. I'm going to try to combine three terms in the past, not just use momentum, but use acceleration, okay? Like the, 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 the vector at t minus one, but also the vector at t minus two. And I think it's going to work. I tried it on MNIST and I think it works. Well, no, right? Chebyshev polynomials, in a sense, completely nailed this question. And without theory, without, you know, intelligent people coming up with these results, we'd be wasting a lot of time, like a lot of students' time. Okay, so that's something that I believe that let's please don't uh, never underestimate the role of theory here. Okay, so that was the good things, I think. And I will have maybe 15 more minutes, if that's okay. Yeah? Okay, so what are the bad things, things that I don't like so much about deep learning? Uh, there's a lot of hype. Okay, so hype uh, corresponds to, I mean, these things that we are suffering, right? That we have, uh, like people from outside the, the academic community who is uh, writing about deep learning, commenting about deep learning. Uh, there are other things that are related to AI, uh, general AI, okay, the, how the Terminator is gonna put every, every, every one of us in danger, uh, and how this hype is actually affecting research program, okay? This very nice equilibrium, very delicate equilibrium between important questions that require many years to be solved and shorter questions that are going to give you papers, okay, at NIPS or whatever. And then there's another thing that is uh, also like a bad thing or, you know, somehow, well, you could argue if it's bad or not, but there's something that this trend that I told you before, like these crazy rates that every year the problem is uh, solved, improved by a factor of two, they cannot go on forever, okay? It's like a law. I mean, it's like a universal law, right? At some point, we'll reach a floor where the more time you invest, the less you will get in, you will get in return. Okay? And this is something that is happening in academia. It's, it's, a, it's a problem for us in academia, but it's also a problem for you guys in industry. Right? I mean, if you have this very crazy idea that uh, you, know, you, are, you believe that you're going to make a lot of money by applying the latest deep learning model to your whatever data set, well, I think it's not going to work anymore. Okay? So it, if you had done this three years ago, maybe, but now it's not anymore the case. Right? I mean, and it's a consequence of the fact that things have, have gone too fast, maybe, like very fast. So what do I mean by the hype? Okay, so, uh, well, yeah, what I told you here is that, uh, you know, the first slide that I told you before, right? I mean, what do we do is we take a bunch of layers, we put them together, we get data, we compute gradients, and we hope for the best. And it's actually, most of the things are really that. Okay, it's not so hard. I mean, it's not so hard to do. It's not so hard to start playing, you know, with how many layers, many filters, etc. So this is good in the sense that many people can do that, right? Many people can get involved, even if they don't have a PhD in math, right? They can, they can start playing with that. But what I think is that it's also not so good because it really puts too many people on the wrong problems, okay? It's not about just tuning and getting, you know, 1% in ImageNet better, okay? It's, I don't think that this is where uh, like the smartest people should be working on. And sometimes it's hard. It's hard to convince people to work on the right problems. Uh, of course, uh, another thing that I don't really like, okay, that it's bad, is that it's really, in deep learning, we are now being reviewed, not by the way traditionally uh, science is being, re is being reviewed. So those of you who are used to, you know, uh, journal papers or conference papers, you know, you are always a bit stressed, right? You send the paper, there's a reviewer that is going to read out your stuff, very, going to be very critical, and he's going to tell you that you have to do this, 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 and then you do it, and then you send it again, and maybe you are very lucky, you get accepted, right? And it takes, takes time, right? It takes time and it takes effort. But everything makes, I mean, this is necessary. It makes, it, it really separates what is good from what is not so good. Right now, do we have this in deep learning? Well, it's not so clear. Uh, we have now, media who is taking papers in archive. So archive, for those of you who are not familiar, is like a repository, okay? You have a paper, you put it in archive, and it's visible after two days to everyone, okay? And actually, I will, t I will come back to this later. It has very, very, very good things, and it has helped us a lot. But it also has dangers, okay? And now, you put the paper on archive, uh, it has a factory, uh, like a, you know, a nice name, you put like, I don't know, 
you put like a nice word in the title, okay? So it catches the attention. Maybe it comes from a nice lab, it comes from DeepMind or from Facebook or some other nice place. And then boom, some journalist reads it. Oh, that could be a very nice article, okay? And people would be very, very tempted. Uh, and so you have, uh, you know, um, titles like this and you can have, uh, you know, stuff like this with a very beautiful, with a beautiful lady playing with a robot. And, and of course it's a game, right? And once you are into this game, uh, you know, the companies have the, their PR people trying to, you know, uh, take, take the most of it, uh, take advantage of it. And those of us who are in academia, we are, of course, we are not going to have a PR person in our department, right? It's not going to happen. And so uh, that's something that I, uh, yeah, so that, that's something that I think it's bad and we should be aware of it, okay? And that's, well, I'm not going to say more. Okay, so going back to archive. Archive is very good. I told you that it has very good things. And it's actually something that I wanted to maybe relate with another very, very uh, sort of well-known uh, sort of, you know, uh, dichotomy in software engineering, people who do computer science, is this uh, model of the cathedral and the model of the bazaar. Okay, so I don't know if you heard about it. So there are essentially two ways to do nice things. One is the cathedral and one is the bazaar. Okay, and it has been applied for software and so what is the cathedral? The cathedral is a, is a model where before releasing it to the public, I'm going to make sure that it's perfect, pristine, okay? Super beautiful, all the code needs to run, no bugs. Uh, I'm not going to show everyone anything until it's perfect, it's ready, okay? And that's something that was, in a sense, followed by some uh, software projects that are very well known, like GCC, compilers, uh, Emacs. I don't like Emacs, I like VI, so. I don't know if you are using Emacs here, but don't use it. And then there's the <laughs> bazaar. Okay, the bazaar is like the, you know, it's a place where it's a bit anarchic, like everyone, uh, you know, uh, sets up the store, uh, you know, you need, an, you need more space, well, let's, let's design a road over there. Like, no guidance, okay? So it's a, it's, a, it's a scheme where the code is developed as we go. Okay, so the code is, the code is developed in the open, and of course, it has advantages, right? I mean, you, it, you can react much more often. Okay? You don't have to wait 10 years until the cathedral is done. Or oh, I don't know how many years the Sagrada Familia has been in construction. Okay, but you, you can see the difference, right? It's one model, I'm going to wait a lot until it's perfect, and then I will show it to the public. The other model, I don't care about mistakes. I don't care about bugs. And uh, maybe the bugs are going to be found easier if everyone is aware of them. If everyone can start using the code, and then it can be fixed. So this is something that has been used, for example, in Wikipedia, right? Wikipedia is a bizarre model, okay? So you, you know, you, you, kept, you keep adding pages. People are fixing the, the pages. Works very well. So somehow the model of, you know, the traditional peer reviewing model is like the cathedral, right? You send the journal, you send the paper, it gets reviewed one year. Now it's perfect. Okay, publish it. Okay, and then you read the paper and it has gone through this process. Archive is more like the bazaar, right? You send your paper, Maybe you send three papers, two of them are wrong. Uh, okay, you put them back and there's one that survived and you know, you get this interaction and people communicate ideas much faster. So in a sense, my question is, well, you know, you might have your arguments. You might, you might believe that one is better than the other for software engineering, but is research the same as software engineering? Okay, do whatever applies to one, does it apply to the other? And I think that there's, there's a question. I mean, it's not a definitive answer, right? I think that uh, somehow we need some balance, okay? And, and in this community, we might be a little bit off balance right now, okay? So there, there's not enough rigor in uh, the way papers are being produced, okay? So that's, anyway, that's what I think. Okay, and then the other thing I would like to add is that, I mean, we are, we, for, we belong to a machine learning community. I don't know if, who of you here is an active researcher in the machine learning community, but we are a community that is driven by conferences, okay? It's not like journals. And we have three major conferences right now a year. We have NIPS that is going to be, by the way, in Barcelona this year. We have ICML, we have ICLR, and you have three of these conferences every year, right? And so could, do you really need to produce more than three papers a year? That's the question, right? I mean, do you have three papers that are really worth publishing more? Do you really need to publish three a month? Some groups might, might need because, I don't know, if you are like Mike Jordan, for example, my colleague, he has 20 students, all of them super good, super brilliant. Of course, you, don't, you are not going to ask him to publish three papers a year, right? He needs to have a larger quota. But let's think about 
I mean, maybe there's a, not, there's a model that we can come up to that sort of tries to tune down a little bit the number of papers. And of course, the other thing that is important here is how, as a community, how, what can we do to make people work on the long-term ideas? Okay, the ideas that are not going to give you an article in the Guardian or you know on the BBC, but that are sort of fundamental, a bit more fundamental. Okay, and this is something that uh, you know everyone chooses to work on what they believe, and I believe that uh, it, I would be very happy to see more people working on more like long-term ideas. Okay, something uh, something else I talked about is this idea that you have a, like a law of diminishing returns. I told you that you know, object classification is reaching its limit. Uh, some other problems are going to be in that limit as well. And so what happens here is that people, you know, it's like a, like a bunch of bees, you know, that they see like a pot that is very sweet and everyone goes there. The, pea, the, the pot is completely emptied. There's only the corrupts. And then they decide, they see that, you know, there's no more like low-hanging fruit to be done here and they move to another problem. And maybe the problem, maybe the pot is not completely empty. The problem is not completely cracked. But you have this phenomena that, you know, there's all this movement in the community that, that really people are working a lot on one problem. Everyone is working on the same problem. And then, oh, suddenly they move. And, you know, there's another, for example, I envision, I, I mean, you can still see papers that I, it's a paper I really like. I mean, it's, a, it's a, like a student of mine, actually, who was following my class this year. Very nice guy. Very nice paper. Okay, so here, what he's training is a is a model that is, in, in a sense, is a network that is being having uh, allow, I mean, that is able to figure out how to fill the page. Okay, so try to do this at home. Okay, you have a picture, you uh, cut the center of the picture, and then you try to fill it in. Okay, I mean, we are completely unable to do this as humans. This algorithm is able to do it pretty well. Is Sorry. Is yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty unbelievable, and again. Something that maybe it's, we are studying it in this period where this problem is maybe not what the community, oh, vision is solved, let's move to another thing. No, I mean, there are many things that are pretty cool, okay? And so you need to have, I mean, he has a very nice advisor, so who is actually not following the hype as much. So thanks to him, now we have this cool paper. Okay. Uh, another thing that is more like a personal note, I mean, sometimes you feel that you don't have time to think about problems because someone else is going to publish an archive before you have time to solve a problem. Okay, and this is something that, uh, yeah, I mean, you have to go fast or I don't, I mean, I don't want to complain about it, but uh, I don't know, it's more like a debate, qu debate question, right? I mean, if we have a field that is very crowded, you have to be ready to accept the game, right? If you are working in an area that is, you have, you know, that there's many people working on the same area at the same time as you, you have to be able to live with a certain amount of stress, right? That you have to go fast. And sometimes going fast with research, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure it's the best. Uh, so, yeah, whatever. Okay, what about the ugly? And this, with this I will just uh, finish, uh, like five minutes, ten minutes. Okay, uh, a couple of things that I just wanted to, to point out, right? I mean, uh, ugly things in the sense that these are things that are uh, fixable, I mean, uh, maybe easier to fix than the others. And so the one is that, the one that I really, the first one I wanted to, to talk to you is the, the, the notion of reproducible research. Okay, so that's actually a concept that is not just, it's not just a particular to deep learning, uh, to machine learning, it's really to science, right? And, and probably you have seen all these uh, papers and, you know, uh, I don't know, there's a very famous, there are very famous examples of, uh, you know, uh, people saying, well, I don't know, smoking, uh, is not affected by, it doesn't affect uh, cancer, or you know, or, or you come up with this uh, test that, I don't know, they found that, I don't know. I mean, there was this very nice uh, comic article in Dilbert, right? That they were saying uh, eating uh, red uh, jelly beans causes some, you know, cancer. It's completely crazy. But this actually happened, right? I mean, you have experiments that if you, uh, you know, if you have an experiment that is nonsense, it's probably not gonna give you the answer that you are looking for, right? But if you do 100 experiments that are nonsense, what is the probability that one of them is gonna just by chance give you the, the answer that is crazy? Well, just do the math, right? At some point, eventually, there will be an article that is, you know, there will be a, like a connection that is completely spurious, and it's just because we are not very rigorous, right? I mean, uh, we are not very rigorous with, uh, st with the statistics. And so here what I mean is that 
anything that you do that involves data, the output of your algorithm is a random variable. Okay? It's random. What you are, the prediction that you give me, all these numbers that I gave you before, are not just, OK, my algorithm does 9. No, that's a random variable. right? It's random with respect to many things. It can be random with respect to how did you choose the training set. Okay? If someone gave it to you, like if you took it from ImageNet, well, they did the choice for you, but it doesn't mean that it's not random. Uh, if you are using an algorithm that is random, like for example SGD, well, there's some randomness in there. So what you have to tell me is you have to tell me what is your what is the variance or what is the error bars of this random variable. And so that's something that we need and it's easy to fix. Another thing that is that I believe that is important uh, is uh, being respectful or being trying to. Uh, be as exhaustive as we can with the baseline. What is a baseline in this problem? A baseline corresponds to like a default. Okay, so I don't know. I can tell you that I can. I can. I can cover. I can do this task in five. Well, this. What does it mean? It means nothing, right? I have to tell you what is the baseline. If I if I did it yesterday, did I do it at four point nine or did I do it at one? Okay, you need a re you need a reference. You need a baseline to sort of evaluate if your model is doing well or not. And so baselines are hard to obtain, are hard to, to, I mean, they take time to grad students. If you are in a deadline mode, it's a pain to do the baseline because you know that you want to get your algorithm better. So any baseline that you do, I mean, the less baselines you try, the better your algorithm is going to look, right? So it's really, there's no incentive to, to, be, to create good baselines. And this is what happens, right? And in a field that is, sorry, we all, if you are going to hear me in YouTube, but uh, <laughs> An example of image captioning, right? That's something that happened. Uh, there was a lot of buzz on this problem, okay? Very complicated models, okay? You have, a, you have an image, you have a confnet, you have a LSTM on the text, you generate text, it's pretty good. You do nearest neighbors, okay? Using a confnet, you get essentially the same thing, okay? It's, uh, I have to be fair, it's the same thing uh, if you are using the same metric, okay, so they're using the metric that these m models were trained on. If you show these things to humans, they still prefer the fancy ones, which is great, right? Which is awesome. But this baseline, perhaps we, you know, with less uh, stress by the community, because I mean, you have to know there were six labs working on that problem at the same time. Are you gonna are you gonna risk uh, missing the deadline because you want to do this, and then the five others are gonna publish and you are not gonna publish? I mean. Okay, and the last thing, uh, grid search. Okay, so grid search, and it's something that I put here as a sort of a more uh, like a challenge, right? Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, so some of the, m most of these algorithms, they have parameters that we train using gradient descent, and they have parameters that we don't train using gradient descent. For example, the number of layers in a network or the step in which the gradient descent operates, okay? what's called the learning rate, or, I don't know, the momentum term. Okay? We know that we heard that momentum is very good, but still has a parameter there. Okay? So these things are not parameters that we typically do gradient descent on, because if we did, there would be a new set of parameters that would control the new gradient descent. Okay? So there's always this uh, chicken and egg problem. So what do we do with these parameters? Uh, we, what's called, we grid them. Okay, what do we mean by grid? It means that you don't know what, a, what the value of a parameter is, but you might have an idea of this value, this parameter should be between minus one and one, let's say. So what do you do? Well, you just create a grid, okay? And you test all of them. Okay, so let's say that you have here three parameters, you take all the possible points in that cube and you test all of them. And that, has, that is very nice because uh, you can, what's called distribute this, okay? So you can have, you know, you can send uh, one job to every machine and they operate in parallel and at the end you just choose the best. Okay, that's a very, a very nice way to parallelize uh, these, uh, these problems. But of course, what happens? Uh, how many of these parallel threads uh, are you going to test? Well, the, the number of points here that you see, it grows exponentially, right? The more parameters you test, or the, like the, the finer the grid that you're testing on, the more GPUs you need. And so what I think is that this creates a very, very important uh, disadvantage, right? If you, have, if you are in a place where you can afford to launch like 60,000 jobs, right? I have heard this number, right? You have 60,000 GPUs 
that you use to optimize your network. Right? Who has 67 GPUs? Google, yeah, maybe Facebook, but I don't, right? And probably none of you have access to this number, right? And this is actually, well, I mean, it's on the one hand, it's great because it, you know, it, they, are, they are there to solve a problem that we couldn't solve otherwise, so that's good, but we are competing against something that is very hard to compete against, okay? And this is actually uh, something that is very hard to say, ah, yeah, they are brute forcing the problem. I'm going to be smarter, right? I'm going to, you know, I can do the same with one GPU that they can with 60. Very hard, okay? Finding the right hyperparameter is a hard task. Okay, so, uh, yeah. So with that, I think I'm going to just, uh, because I wanted to tell you about something else, but I think it's getting a bit late. So, uh, yeah, well, just maybe one slide to just, uh, show you what are the things that we are working on. So, um, yeah, it's actually one of the reactions of one of the things I said, right? That I told you that the Envision uh, things seem to be uh, either completely solved, boring, or very crowded, right? Very risky, very stressful. So there, one of the nice things about this is that it forces you to work on something else, right? So not just put all your eggs in one basket. Try to look for other things where you can contribute or you can, you know, uh, create new stuff. And so one of the things that I, I've been working on a little bit uh, with one, one student is what's called the algorithmic learning problem. Okay, so this is a, like a completely crazy thing, right? I mean, uh, I will give you, for example, like sorting, okay, sorting problem. So we know how to sort numbers, right? I give you n numbers, you know how to sort them, right? And you can sort them, you know more than that, you know how to do it in an optimal way, okay? So you know that what is the best algorithm that does that. But still, we are going to say, well, can we, train, can we learn these things from data? Okay, so if I give you a bunch of examples of uh, numbers and then their sorted versions, how can we learn them? Okay? Is it possible? With what algorithm? With what complexity? Okay? Uh, so these are uh, for sorting can work, and then there are many other tasks that have the same flavor. And they are here in these papers that I put here. And so I just wanted to talk very briefly about this, but I don't know if maybe... Well, I, don't know. I think I'm getting a little bit out of time. So maybe what I will do is that if someone is interested in this problem, because it's very crazy, so if someone uh, wants to know a bit more, just come to see me offline, and I will show you a little bit what this is about. So I think I will stop here, and of course I'm going to get some questions. Thank you. For certain tasks, for example, I'm thinking about uh, computational advertising. Can you wh where might it pays where, where might it pay off to use deep learning instead of a more simple algorithm? Because previously we saw that, for example, with nearest neighbors, you can get good results for certain tasks. So yeah. where would you try to explore deep learning in problems that are solved with other algorithms? Yeah, that's a very good question. So. Um, what I told you is that for me, the successful, so right now, you should believe in convolutional neural networks. Okay, so, so where can you apply convolutional neural networks? You, know, you can apply them to data that lives in some uh, grid space, right? For example, images have pixels, and pixels are arranged in a grid. Okay, so in a grid, that's good. Uh, if you have a time series, like, you know, uh, like speech, or you have, let's say, measurements from your sensor that is trying to do some seismic processing, if you're like an oil, co oil company, okay, and you want to know which places to dig, to dig your, your well. And then I would tell you, well, you better have a look at these deep learning models because you might get something out of it. If you are working with data that is completely unstructured, uh, for example, advertising, we had a very wonderful talk at the MLSS with uh, Nicolas Leroux from Criteo, who is working on the ad placement problem, like uh, he's from Criteo. And there they have features that are completely unstructured, right? You just have the username. You have the cookies that you have visited before. You have some uh, browsing history. 
are you going to apply a deep learning model there? I don't know. It, I would be a bit more skeptical there. And so I don't know if that answers the question a little bit. Any other task where you think that it doesn't pay so apart from that it doesn't this work. one? Uh, in tasks that are very noisy. Okay, so you have a lot of time series problems where you have a lot of noise in the input. Okay, so noisy inputs don't play very well with deep learning models today. Uh, we have people working on it. Uh, I think it's a very interesting question. But typically, uh, there are many, many time series in which it's actually very, very, very hard to do better than linear regression. Okay, and actually linear regression is old as dirt, right? It's really uh, just solving least squares. So there are still many things where simple models actually work super well. And so, uh, yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, uh, previously, uh, you mentioned that uh, there is a, a very uh, a, a good necessity or to have a proper theory to justify the working. Like the comnets, the they are just wonderful in their outputs, and we have seen a lot of uh, state of art art coming up uh, in the past few years. So, uh, what my question is. Uh, uh, where, which direction you think uh, would give give us a proper justification or kind of a uh, we can we could come up with a proof to uh, oh. Oh. to give them a proper you know a validation kind of thing? Good question. I mean, very hard question. So, so one of the things that I would start by trying to do, and actually, as a matter of fact, that's what I'm working on, is try to uh, reduce or nail down the functional spaces, like the spaces in which uh, you can characterize natural images or natural speech. So you can actually construct a mathematical uh, story. Okay, So you say, well, I'm going to define a space of functions that have this property, this property, this property. And then you can prove things. Okay, Assuming that my point is in that space, then a convolutional neural network is the model that has this property, this property, and this property. And any other model, or a model that has this property, this property, this property, has, must have this form. And then you have a hypothesis, right? My hypothesis is mathematically expressed as a set, right? A functional space. And then you can try, you can then ask the question, well, what belongs into that set? Right? If you have proved that conflicts are optimum for a functional space that has one point, and this point you don't care, that's a useless theory, right? So that's pretty easy to do. But the whole point is sort of to realign the functional spaces that are small enough so that you can say interesting things but large enough such that they contain natural images. And that's actually a very, it's, a, it's really a long, long, long term question. Yeah, because we really don't know how many functions we might need there. Well, I mean, uh, math mathematicians have uh, cared about this problem. For example, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, like literature, but you have uh, spaces of bounded variation. Okay, that was very popular in the 90s. Uh, we thought that we could, uh, you know, incorporate functions that are not just integrable, but also have some jumps, okay? Because images have jumps from the edges. It, it turns out that this space is far too large, right? Because images have jumps, but there are many other crazy things that have jumps and don't look like images at all. Okay, so this space is too large. It's not adapted to understand really what's going on. And so, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for a good, good talk. So, uh, so you mentioned that uh, uh, entering deep learning research uh, is easy in the sense that there is a low barrier. There are these open source softwares that you can start using and then you can immediately uh, train your network and start mm -hmm. having good results. But, uh, but in my experience, entering uh, bona fide deep learning research is, uh, is much, much harder than that. Oh, yeah, so yeah. it seems like that, uh, that, the narrative, that the narrative itself of, of deep learning research is very much owned by the large labs. Uh, so if you're from a certain lab in, in Canada or from a certain lab in New York or something like <laughs> that, then, uh, yeah, um, then you may have a much easier time uh, publishing your results than if you're at another lab. And that's, this is a problem. Yeah, I should put this maybe in the slide, but that would be very hard to, that would be a very delicate slide to put, right? Uh, <laughs> but you know, you're right, you're right. I mean, once you are in this between, right, you, are, you have crossed the first barrier, so you can start producing results, but you are not in the second barrier where you are really saying things that are deep, like profound, 
okay? Mm -hmm. uh, between these things, you have a lot of people. It's very, you have a lot of people. And then it's true that among these people, if you come from a good lab, you might be better off. And the question is, do we have this bias only in deep learning or do we have it everywhere? And that's a question, right? I mean, it would be awesome if we couldn't have this thing. And we have tools for that, right? We have double blind reviews. We have, uh, yeah, actually double blind reviews is actually the best thing we have, right? It's like you, you submit to a conference, we don't know who the author is, we don't know who the reviewer is. That should try to mitigate this problem. But it's true that in the, when you go to conferences and you, you, know, you see people, well, it's, it's, it would be naive to think that there's no bias like that. And yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I think we have to leave it that, but yeah, it's yeah, a good okay. point. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, Joan, one question on the issue of how many data are actually be, is actually being uh, needed by deep learning. So one of the criticisms is you need to have large data sets to train mm -hmm. your models. Do you think that's, which side are you on? Do you think it's really uh, something inherent to how many data are, you, are needed to fit uh, many layers or is it a problem more of the algorithmic uh, uh, complexity uh, that mm. would be required to learn from much few, much smaller data sets? Because I've yeah, heard I both opinions and I'm not, I don't no, have I think a that it's, um, uh, I would say, I would say that it's not a question on deep versus shallow. Mm -hmm. It's more actually a question that it's, I mean, I come from a, la from a department where we have all these um, discussions between parametric and non-parametric inference, right? I mean, non-parametric is a very important field in stats that says, well, you have to have a model that grows with the size of your data, okay? Mm -hmm. So it would be, in a sense, it would be a bit naive not to do so, right? I mean, it would be a bit, why would you keep the size of parameters fixed when you have more and more data available to you. It's more like I'm, I'm returning the question, right? Uh, and so, of course, if you are in a regime where you have a very, very small data set, you cannot uh, train a model that has, that where the number of parameters is overwhelmingly large with respect to the number of data sets. So what you need is a strategy to uh, limit the capacity of your model. And we have strategies, right? I mean, we have rich regression, we have a dropout, we have many things to regularize the learning problem so that we reduce the capacity. So we know how to do that. And in a sense, it's orthogonal to which model are you using. Are you using one layer or 10 layers? It's not, I mean, it's true that it's a criticism that people do typically on deep learning, but I think it's actually, it's again, people who are probably themselves not very, like they're not, uh, you know, dealing with these models themselves. Because the fact is that there are ways where you can train uh, neural networks with very small number of parameters, uh, with very small number of training samples. I mean. Typically, they are not behaving the best in that regime. There are other models that do better, but it's not that we are using them wrongly. I mean, it's really something intrinsic to the, to the, to the learning problem. They're not very non-parametric, if that's, that's what, that was your question, yeah. Any, any other questions? Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah.